Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Masters, and as Paul mentioned earlier, uh, I am transitioning uh, from a Sea Bear Fellow into a Associate Director focused primarily on outreach uh, for Sea Bear. And it's uh, my pleasure this morning to introduce our special guest uh, and present him with the uh, inaugural prize for uh, agri environmental innovation. Um, as I was preparing this uh, introduction for Chief Weller, um, you know, I've, I've had occasion to meet the chief a time or two at various meetings uh, around, but I was reading through his bio and some of the information online, and it struck me, and, and I was even talking with some of the, the folks before the meeting started, I, I don't think there's a more well-suited person ever to have the position that, that you have um, from the, you know, your, your educational background, but just coming at the job from having an awareness of what goes on at the state level from your work in California to your work with on the uh, executive side through OMB and the um, understanding how the budgets and all are put together and then actually putting the budgets together with the subcommittee uh, on ag appropriations I think you really do bring an overall understanding of the entire process and what it takes to run an agency with north of 10,000 employees and a, and a budget of over four million dollars and so it was uh, it, it, it really did, did strike me that, you know, Chief Weller, I think you're in exactly in the position that, uh, that, that you were supposed to be. Um, I also suspect that in your role as working on that subcommittee, you heard from an awful lot of stakeholders over the years uh, about, about the budget. So, um, with that experience, what also has struck me and, and what I know about the Chief is he has a, an understanding beyond the processes and the nuts and bolts of running the agency. He understands what the true mission is, and that is helping people help the land, providing programs that benefit landowners and farmers and ranchers, and implementing conservation programs on, on their land. And so I think that, that, uh, that certainly governs uh, what he's done at, uh, at NRCS in his time there. Uh, and, and we'll continue to do so. So as Paul uh, led off this, this morning and as Kent followed up, Sea Bear is all about innovation uh, on the agri-environmental front. You know, behavioral testing, experimentation, how do we make these programs better? So when you, when you think about agricultural production and environmental and conservation, NRCS is really where those two things meet. And so it makes sense, the partnerships that Kent mentioned uh, with Sea Bear and NRCS, those partnerships have, have, uh, have borne fruit thus far, and we, we think they will again. Um, Chief Weller has um, invested an awful lot in the innovation piece. Uh, if you're familiar with the Conservation Innovation Grant Program, uh, you're aware that uh, about half of the money in the last fiscal year was targeted towards an environmental market-based uh, programs. And so he's, he's continued to invest a lot in the Conservation Innovation Grant uh, program. Going back to his work with stakeholders, uh, during his tenure, NRCS also initiated uh, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is a way of leveraging the federal dollars and getting that true buy-in from the local stakeholders on the ground that understand the problems and, and understand uh, what needs to be uh, done from the federal side uh, to help address some of those environmental uh, challenges that, that ag producers are facing. Um, specific to Sea Bear, Kim mentioned a, a number of things. Uh, you know, uh, above all, uh, Chief Weller has uh, demonstrated uh, an appreciation for this type of work. He's encouraged the staff to interact with Paul and Ken and those of us affiliated with Sea Bear. Uh, Kim mentioned the resource stewardship tool. Uh, which I, I know is, is something that NRCS is, is extremely proud of and, and looking to roll out. Um, and there's a clear appreciation in, in my mind for that, that kind of evidence-based policy making uh, and program inter, um, implementation at, at NRCS. Um, I've had an occasion uh, in, in my work in, in Georgia to work a lot with NRCS, um, specifically on rolling out programs to historically underserved producers and I know that's been a focus of, of the Office of Advocacy and Outreach within USDA and, and also to NRCS uh, certainly. And, and we've seen exactly what Paul talked about in his, in his presentation. Just, just some, some small tweaks to how we implement the programs, 
how we talk to the producers, how we engage with producers on their farms makes an enormous difference in how those producers are then going to interact with NRCS and USDA at large. Um, and, and by doing some, some just small tweaks, we've increased equip applications uh, from those producers by two or three hundred percent. We're doing conservation plans uh, for those producers that heretofore were not, were not done. And so I think, it, it, again, it just speaks to uh, the, the chief's understanding uh, of, of meeting those stakeholders and understanding that the landowners uh, are, are really ground zero for getting conservation implementation uh, done. And, and if, if you don't mind, just a, a personal a personal story. Um, I, working working as outreach director uh, for Sea Bear, um, some some of you heard us talking before. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a, a farmer too. I grow uh, Angus cows and pine trees. And incidentally, it's funny the the only Sea Bear staff whose picture was not taken on a farm was mine. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, I work a lot with NRCS in my job. I work a lot with NRCS as an ag producer. I can say with absolute certainty that that you know, culture of innovation, the ethic of trying to get the program right from DC is finding its way down to the farm. My county conservation was on my farm Friday siting a stream crossing. I, there, there's a clear, clear message from D.C. down saying let's get these programs right and I think that that certainly starts at the top. Um, you know, so, you know, as an ag producer, you know, I want to know what works, I know what works, uh, I want to have good data to guide my decisions. I think NRCS wants to have good data driving their decisions. Uh, I think Bear can be a, a great partner in that. I believe that's uh, recognized by the chief. Uh, and, and to a great extent, uh, while we're excited today to present him the prize uh, for agricultural and environmental innovation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Chief Jason Welk. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, thanks for, thank you very much for the warm, uh, I guess accounting uh, of, of my position and my time at NRCS, and I have a couple of USDA, but also NRCS colleagues here. It's good to see you. Uh, but less of a recognition for me, honestly. To your point, it's more recognition for my colleagues at NRCS. I fundamentally view my job is to represent NRCS the best way I can, and to advocate for the tools and resources my colleagues need ultimately to get the job done in the field. So uh, today's recognition, I think, of our contributions and really the spirit of innovation, but more, to me, it goes beyond innovation. It's more just the culture of neighborliness, which is really at its root, is what is at NRCS. Um, so I appreciate CBR lifting us up, lifting the organization up, and really recognizing how we're trying to nudge what we do a little bit differently and think outside the box. So big picture, uh, you all are very conversant in some of the huge, huge challenges we're gonna be facing from an ag production need, not just here in the United States, but globally. And, and I think in our view at USDA, but certainly at NRCS, the resources that we have, the programs we have, the traditional route are absolutely necessary. And I'm very proud of what we do. And Congress has imbued us with great responsibility and very significant resources, but they're not sufficient. And we'll never get to where we need to be from a soil management, a water management, a habitat forest management standpoint with just the traditional route. And so that's why I think under not just my tenure, but also my predecessor's tenure, really this administration, we've been trying to think outside the box. How do we really build upon the culture of innovation, but also really a scientific organization, a technical organization that's rooted in the fundamentals of evidence and evaluation. If you look at the very core of what we do, the DNA of the agency, it's our conservation practice standards. And ensuring those standards are really truly based on evidence then we evaluate their efficacy, and then we apply those standards on the landscape, we can stand behind them, we know they're going to work and actually enhance production, enhance stewardship, and not do detriment to the environment. But beyond just the core practice standards we've had for a long time, different programs, you mentioned the Innovation Grants Program, uh, what we have, also other long-standing programs which have been part of uh, accruing, going out and sensing, and evaluating, what's happening across the landscape. So we have the National Resources Inventory, which is one of the longest longitudinal continental scale 
uh, evidence and evaluation protocols and tools we have, I think, in the world. And from that, we built on that foundation the Conservation Effects Assessment Project, which is a cutting edge approach to take the census of both the ecological characteristics and then, crucially, the management characteristics, the management principles that farmers and ranchers are using. And when, what happens then when you tweak and change those management uh, activities? What happens overall to the ecological uh, health and ecological systems? And from, from seed grows different approaches to how we apply conservation. So we have then launched our landscape conservation initiatives where we're trying to use evidence and evaluation, but also these underlying data, uh, both the underlying data characteristics that we have, but also then the feedback we're getting from our producers on how to better target and apply conservation principles on the landscape, whether to protect water quality here in the Chesapeake Bay, protect water quality in the Great Lakes, improve the health of the forests and lonely pine ecosystems in the southeast, uh, to targeting on-the-ground conservation solutions in less prairie chicken country or sage-grouse country out west. We're trying on massive landscapes to be better about using and harnessing know-how of science, but also learning a little bit from our own uh, tools, but also tools of our partners to really improve our outreach, improve our marketing of our, our conservation, ultimately to get better investments on the landscape. But that isn't necessary and sufficient. And so, as we're looking about our array of tools and all these systems that we apply, and the huge need we have for conservation solutions, how do we take our game even to the next level even further? And that, to me, then, is going back to where we began, which is starting with we were a technical agency. We were born 81 years ago in the wake of the worst man-made, but also climatic ecological disaster our country's ever experienced, which is the Dust Bowl. We were created to provide behavioral social changes on the landscape. Let's go back to the basics, the fundamentals, which is the conservation plan. So we're going now through a very intensive refresh and review of what we're ultimately offering to our customers, farmers and ranchers. And starting with how do we train our employees on the technical aspects of planning, but also then on the marketing aspects of planning. How do you become good salespeople? So you go out and market conservation solutions for a farmer, it's really going to be compelling. You talk them the way you meet them where they're at give them solutions that they are find reasonable but also economic and they want to then incorporate to their operation. And then by the way we have an array of program tools to help get those practices on the landscape. Uh, but beyond the, the fundamentals of just the training, it's also some of the tools that can't be talked about. So we have an initial run at this in, under Diana's, uh, Diana's leadership. We have this resource uh, stewardship and evaluation framework, this tool. We're trying to really provide a higher end conservation product which is going to be providing I think uh, really actionable information to a producer on where they stack up against the NRCS recommended levels of management for their soils and waters and habitat. Uh, but are there some other ways, some tweaks we can make to what we present to a customer that is going to further incentivize and want them to apply conservation principles in their operation? So I, I'm really excited about your help in helping us pilot some different approaches on how we market, how we frame it up, how we present it in a more compelling fashion, but also perhaps a less complex fashion. It's one thing that NRCS does is complex. <laughs> we take basic principles and we make it hard. Uh, so we sometimes need help on unraveling our axle and at the end of the day be able to provide, I think, a more compelling and uh, attractive product to our customers. So they, in turn, want to take it on and use it. But beyond that, it's also then market. So what uh, the social behavior of sciences, what you guys outlined, the, the, the tasting samplings, there can't you outline some really good uh, projects you have in motion. It's actually pretty interesting to hear what you guys are up to. Um, but to actually turn producers into our own marketers. So that's one of the, the best ways to, to incentivize and expand conservation solutions is how farmer-to-farmer -farmer engagement, farmer-to-farmer, peer-to-peer transfer of, of conservation solutions, how do we empower farmers to become our sales force? Then beyond marketing, I think social and behavioral uh, techniques and approaches can also then help with adoption and ultimately about the maintenance of conservation solutions. So that hopefully we don't need to expand uh, regulatory approaches. Uh, certainly, in my view, the current social license to expanding regulation is probably at its lowest point I've ever seen. We're not going to see a massive expansion of regulation in any near term. We're not going to see a significant expansion of federal investments in conservation programs. If anything, we're going to continue to see a slow, steady erosion of federal investments in these programs. So looking at the huge demand and need, but with shrinking or reduced supply, how do we make those axes meet in a way that ultimately provides what we need, which is sustainable production of food, but also a healthy environment? So, Seabury, you guys and the colleagues and our partners in the research community, you guys are at that crossroads. 
You're helping us think outside the box, be creative, be innovative, but also help us better communicate what it is we do, ultimately, hopefully, better incentivize good solutions on the land. So thank you for recognition for NRCS's innovation, our neighborliness, but also our forward-looking march. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to partner with CBEAR and the uh, research community to help us improve, ultimately, what we do, which is to help people help the land. So thank you very much. Uh, I see we have some questions that uh, we'd like to ask you while you're here. All right. Oh, great. Great. So I wanted to ask you, um, when you talk about evidence, there's often the evidence of what works and also evidence of what doesn't work. And I was wondering, how do you create a culture where uh, it's okay for staff to, to, to report failures as well as successes? <laughs> We hear a lot about the failures, uh, <laughs> but we, I, 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 if anything, we have a culture. Uh, I, I don't think this is unique to NRCS. Honestly, the culture within large organizations is uh, new is or different is what's actually not appreciated. They like to try and true the traditional, yeah. uh, and when we try new things, we hear how it doesn't work, and we never hear how it actually works. And so the, the research tool evaluation tool is one of those things where I hear more grousing about it's a new thing uh, and it, how much time it takes. And so it's when I'm out traveling, I, I get an earful uh, and I don't hear the, the positive. Uh, we're trying to do a complete overhaul of our conservation stewardship program, CSP. Uh, <laughs> the, the feedback, the critical feedback, uh, some of it constructive. Uh, Far, far away is the, the actual positive, it, what, which I think is embedded, and I think maybe people just take uh, intrinsic that the positive is there, so they're, therefore they need to raise up or elevate the negative. Um, so I think what's needed instead is, is a more productive way to harness the constructive criticism. I'm not afraid of crit criticism, I just don't like the waste of energy on just criticism for venting sake. But if you don't like what's there, how do we better harness uh, the constructive feedback? So from, from the professionals in the field that really are trying to sell this stuff, and they find what the way it's framed out, the way these, these products are, are prepared, or the way the training was developed doesn't work, there needs to be a venue that then allows us to bring that constructive criticism back. So we are trying to look at the CSP program. We did a nationwide um, survey. We really pushed it out. We're piloting it in all states. We had a template feedback form but we're really trying to find the constructive criticism so that we can now make the changes and tweaks. So instead of just being a kind of open forum uh, listserv where people just you know use cinnamon, synonyms uh, and, and launch the hand grenades into the forum and then right. depart, we actually have a constructive way for our employees to give us the, the changes to the programs we need. So I, I would like to think we actually have a culture, one that allows for the constructive feedback. I think we have a ways to go. Uh, I don't think we're where we're at, but I starting with me. I actually welcome, um, and sometimes it, not everything is positive, right? But we need to know in a way that then actually helps us fix, as opposed to just being a, a venue for people to for splints. So, is that too direct? I don't know. So, one question I I have is, you know, as you. Think about the interface between academia and the agencies, right? I, mean, I think it's fair to say that academia sometimes we are off pursuing our own agendas, and that's um, you know often poorly timed with the questions that you may be facing. Uh, we might come up with the uh, answers to the questions that you thought of, you know, that you had four years ago, right? That are our delay, or or perhaps we presented in a forum that is uh, not very accessible to. Uh, your staff or to your key stakeholders. Uh, you know, I think one of the goals of CBEAR is to bridge some of these gaps, but I think you know we ourselves are a uh, work in progress. And I wondered if you had some reflections, um, you know, knowing academia the way you do, and yet also being in the positions you've had about you know what are the types of communications and collaboration, collaborations that work, and which ones you think need to you know be improved and how. 
be more effective? Uh, so one approach, and it's one uh, trying to synthesize this in a way that will make sense, um, is to engage with professional societies. So our agency, we are a technical scientific agency. We have, have had historic relationships with professional societies, uh, such as Society for Small Water Management, Society for Range Management, etc. Um, where it's this interplay between practitioners and the academic communities where there's a very good exchange in both directions, but it also is a way to ensure a relevancy, I guess is maybe the heart of your question, mm -hmm. that it, they can help identify cutting edge or what's coming around the corner, what is like clear and present, um, and not necessarily investing in, in research that it may be four years in the rearview mirror or four years in advance and it's just the time isn't right, we're out of, out of synchronization. So we're trying to invest, starting this year, allow for more engagement with our employees and to attend and participate at these, not just senior employees, but I really wanted to we set aside money to invest for our field people to actually start attending these conferences in significant numbers. We've had to not do that. We've been through this, this weird period in the federal government where uh, very significant cuts, budget sequestrations, budget shutdowns. Um, certain agency went to Vegas and had clowns and mind readers and stuff. <laughs> so we sort of had to chill out on conference attendance for a while, uh, but now it's time to reinvest in that and to reconnect our field practitioners back with the scientific community. And I think participation at and investment in these professional societies, and I'll be honest, I've attended some of them, and there's not a lot of attendance, even from the academic community. I think there needs to be a better engagement and reinfusion on both ends of the spectrum back in these professional societies is serving as a, a form of venue to allow for the cross fertilization, sharing of ideas, seeding of uh, new research projects, but also, you know, I think just frankly trading of business cards, um, which is part of it too, to help facilitate research but also help with tech transfer. Um, but also, honestly, a lot of it is in the language you use. So I was looking at some of the, you know, the grants that CBR has funded. And uh, I, one of them, I think you lost me at the first word, which was endogenous. And I went home and asked my wife, and I was really embarrassed, endogenous, what? She's like, no, no, it's not erogenous, it's endogenous. <laughs> <laughs> so I think even how you present the research in a way that needs to be accessible from a practitioner standpoint, that you're, you're, we are a scientific technical agency, but you're dealing mostly with people with a bachelor's of sciences or maybe a master's of science not doctorates of science, um, and they need to be able to take what you're learning, but be able to translate in a way that ultimately they can talk to a farmer about. And so they're at that that blood-brain barrier, uh, and you need to find a way that makes it accessible for them, because they're very busy people, uh, and, if it's, and if it's couched in a very uh, epistological, um, inaccessible framework, it makes it really hard, and they're not gonna want to invest the time. So I guess, Careful with the language you use, uh, but also starting engaging with these professional societies as a venue to allow for uh, better engagement. accessible to everyone. Um, preliminary feedback has been, well, this is not what I'm used to, and I don't like it. So it's a pretty risky bet on the eve of a farm over authorization to be tinkering with a $1.3 billion program that has 80 million acres enrolled. <laughs> so it, it's sort of a high risk maneuver. We'll find out whether this is a, a wise bet or not. But frankly, even some of the things we're trying to do, uh, we mentioned at the outset, even with innovation grants, We've been pushing more and more into the environmental market space, but also into the space of conservation finance, which is about how to engage private capital. Um, so how do you engage Goldman Sachs, uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Cobalt Banker? I mean, 
into conservation. And uh, not without some trepidation, because these are the same folks that crashed the international economy. And they now want to come in and be the overlords of the environment, right? So it's a little, like, oh, okay. But they wanted, they, I think, earnestly wanted, they see an opportunity for return. But from uh, just a public policy standpoint, and ultimately with the eye towards what's best for the, for the producer, for the farmer, family farm, is it really these are the folks you want to engage in this or not? Um, so yeah, there, there's, I have some trepidation about what we're doing, but in the end, it comes back to where it started. The resources we have are necessary, but not sufficient. And we've got to think about expanding our network of partners, approaching our work in a different way. Uh, and ultimately, I'm more optimistic we have more players as part of the conversation, but also investing on the ground. And so it's worth, I think, getting outside of our lane once in a while and, and bringing new people in. So. Thank you so much. Thank you.